Hello, Booktube, and welcome to Poetry Thursday, when some Booktubers will read you a poem and perhaps chat about it. <laughs> I don't know, I don't notice much in the way of chatting from anyone other than myself, but I can't even say hello without chatting, so you'll, you're bound to get that. Uh, all on the same psychodrama trajectory. Because I'm not just reading any random poems this year, I'm reading this book, 20th Century American Poetry, which goes roughly chronologically through the 20th century, poet by poet, minor and major. Uh, it, this is going to be, uh, to put it mildly, a voyage of discovery for me, <laughs> especially since I am dedicated to just continuing through. There will be, uh, I can only think in the course of this book of only two things that I might not read. Uh, and not because I necessarily hate the poet. I'm, I'm not going to read uh, poems in a black dialect, in, in a, a very folksy, very Uncle Remus-style black dialect. I understand, I acknowledge that Harlem Renaissance writers, some of them might have wanted to use that dialect to make points of their own, but there is no upside to me reading it out loud on a video that's going to be online forever. <laughs> There's no upside to that at all. And the same thing is true once we get uh, past the year of extinction, past 1959. After that, modern 20th century American poetry is often more expletive than anything else and i won't be reading those either but we'll see we'll see what we can pick and choose fortunately we don't have to worry about that for a while yet like for instance we are still in the 1920s we've been in the 1920s for months here in this book even though the terminal date of the poets is getting later and later they're still managing to do most of their noteworthy work in the 1920s and today we are reading john crow ransom i'll read you two poems by john crow ransom uh, who was uh, an editor and a book critic. I would argue, first and foremost, he was those things before he was a poet. And I think it shows in his poetry. I, I, was, I went into this, this anthology is really good, it's really good at picking poems, really good at introducing poets. I went into this anthology thinking, well, maybe this book will change your mind about that. A long, long, long time ago, not the 1920s, but not that far off, a long time ago, long before most of you were born, I had a discussion on this kind of subject uh, with a friend of mine who was a, a poet and a novelist, but not a critic and not an editor, and certainly not an academic. And he said that he didn't trust editors who also dabbled in either poetry or fiction. He didn't, he didn't trust it, and that it, he said that it was easy to tell when the editing was their primary calling and not the genre they were dabbling in, as he put it. He called it dabbling. Uh, and I asked him, how on earth could you tell the difference? This is where an innocent taste, when, when it's easy to tell the difference now. But then I said, how on earth could you tell the difference? Uh, someone who, let's say, for instance, an editor who studies and loves poetry will maybe want to turn his hand to poetry from time to time to writing it. How on earth would you be able to tell the difference? Uh, what would make one poetry and the other not? And he gave me uh, an illustration that I have always remembered. Think of yourself. Let's say you're a really good cook. I'm not, but let's say you are. Let's say you're a really good cook. And you have a friend coming in from out of town you haven't seen in weeks. He lives two towns over. He doesn't. You don't get to see each other as much as you as you once did. So you want to make him a nice meal uh, when he comes to visit. Picture that, and then picture that you've been given an opportunity to make a nice meal and have a nice, friendly, conversational evening with your best friend who died two years ago. You get a night, one last night. My friend used to say, it's the same you, it's the same ingredients, it's the same food, but you'll cook it different. And I said, oh, well, yes, when you put it that way, yes, I, I, someone certainly would, but what's the point? And he said, the difference is poetry. I always remember that line, the difference is poetry. Uh, certainly, I, I myself don't cook. <laughs> I would give anything to have an evening with that friend, but uh, I get it. I think I get what he was trying to say. I didn't usually, but I think I did in this case. The difference is poetry. 
where it, the thing will be exactly the same, but there will be a difference. And I don't know. I went into John uh, John Crow Ransom trying to think that maybe that wouldn't be true, and maybe it won't be true for you. I want to read you two of his poems. Uh, both, I believe, from the 1920s. Yeah, he, he largely drifted away from writing or even really seeming to mean to write poetry later in his life. Uh, and I, I think he, he's another one of those editors who had a late date. Yeah, 1974. Died in 1974. So we're talking about poems he wrote 50 years before he died. Uh, I want to read you two poems. The first one is called Winter Remembered. Two evils, monstrous either one apart, possessed me and were long and loth at going. A cry of absence, absence in the heart, and in the woods the furious winter blowing. Think not when fire was bright upon my bricks, and past the tight boards hardly a wind could enter. I glowed like them, the simple burning sticks, far from my cause, my proper heat and center. Better to walk forth in the frozen air and wash my wounds in the snow, that would be healing, because my heart would throb less painful there, being caked with cold and past the smart of feeling. And where I walked, the murderous winter blast would have this body bowed, these eyeballs streaming. And though I think this heart's blood froze not fast, it ran too small to spare one drop for dreaming. Dear love, these fingers that had known your touch and tied our separate forces first together were ten poor idiot fingers not worth much, ten frozen parsnips hanging in the weather. That That is lovely. I think we can agree. <laughs> that is lovely. That is perfectly technically controlled. Uh, and Planchet, it looks, it looks longingly at the past. And so is this next one. The next one I chose here is Dead Boy. The little cousin is dead. By foul subtraction, the green bough from the Virginia's aged tree, and none of the county, the county kin like the transaction, nor some of the world of outer dark like me. A boy not beautiful, nor good, nor clever, a black cloud full of storms too hot for keeping, a sword beneath his mother's heart, yet never woman bewept her babe as this is weeping. A pig with a, fa a pasty face, so I had said, squealing for cookies, kinned by poor pretense, with a noble house. But the little man quite dead, I see the forebear's antique lineaments. The elder men have strode by the box of death to the wide flag porch, and muttering low, send round the brute of the day. O oh, friendly waste of breath, their hearts are hurt with deep dynastic wound. He was pale and little, the foolish neighbors say. The first fruits, saith the preacher, the Lord hath taken. But this was the old tree's late branch wrenched away, grieving the sapless limbs, the shorn and shaken. Here we where we got intentionally antique language. I assure you, the brute of the day was antique even in the mid nineteen twenties. <laughs> uh, and also, there was one other yeah, antique lineaments. Uh, but <clears throat> the the standard idea here of of poetry like this is to mourn the, the dead boy as the quintessence of all things lovely. Think, for instance, of A. E. Houseman to an athlete dying young. Uh, but here, the boy is nothing to laugh, nothing to remember fondly. He's 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 not a great loss in and of himself. The poem, the poet, the narrator of the poem is l lamenting the loss of the line. This boy was maybe carrying the line of his family on alone, uh, and is now not able to do that, no matter how unpromising he was. And both these poems look at loss. One is the dead boy is more immediate than winter remembered, but both look at loss and try to commemorate it in formal, end rhymed, a b a b verse, and both of them do a really good job, I think. Uh, but <laughs> is it my imagination? Maybe maybe you think differently that something is missing there, that it seems to be uh, all manner and no substance, that the poet doesn't seem to feel it. Uh, you you can remember here the 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 famous quip uh, about Virgil versus Homer. Take away Virgil's style, and what have you got? What's left if you take away his style? Uh, uh, that quip had a lot more teeth in it when people could read Latin, but still, you can sense the gist of it. And I often feel that way about Ransom. I often feel that yes, this is a technically perfect poem, 
and even the emotions in it are technically perfectly conveyed. They are technically perfectly worded. But we've read in Poetry Thursday during our march through this book, we've read a lot of less perfect poems that moved a lot more, I think. Maybe I just have a preconceived notion about Ransom and I, this, this anthology's selections were just not enough for me to shift them. I could be. <laughs> uh, but anyway, what do you think? Uh, did you enjoy those? Do you enjoy this poet? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, not counting it a failure because it was wonderful to revisit his verse. This volume has a few pieces of his verse. Uh, it's just, it didn't change my opinion of him. Uh, maybe I'm, well, I was expecting too much to think that it would. Uh, but I'm going to wrap this up for now. We will meet again next Thursday. <laughs> I will see you then. Thank you, Book Two.